find the world a bitter and complicated place, and it seems to feel the same way about me. I think you and I have this in common. Are you kidding me? I'm just supposed to stay here. Sure, I have an entire book in me. You can't even dream a whole dream, can you? Happy New Year! Yes, I'm aware that it's February, and to that I say no comment. I do, however, just want to say a quick thank you to everyone who subscribed last year. I appreciate the support from all 76 of you. I have loved making these videos so far, and I can't wait to make even more for you this year. Okay, sappiness over. January is arguably a crap month, right? Well, I'll tell you one thing it's been good for. Cinema releases. I don't know about you, but my butt has found itself pleasantly rested in a cinema seat multiple times this month. This is mainly due to the UK distribution, but we'll get to that later. I knew as soon as I left the cinema that I had to make a video about my favourite of the bunch, The Holdovers. The Holdovers is a comedy drama directed by Alexander Payne, who you may know from Sideways, The Descendants or Election. I like his previous films, but for me The Holdovers is definitely his magnum opus. Set in a New England prep school in 1970, it follows a bitterly sarcastic and solitary history teacher played by Paul Giamatti, who is forced to babysit the holdovers, aka the students that cannot return home over Christmas break. Forced together by circumstance, he develops an unlikely connection with Angus, a troublemaking, quick-witted student played by Dominic Sessa, and Mary, a grieving, straight-talking head cook, played by Dave I and Joy Randall. And I won't reveal any more, as this is a spoiler-free review. This video is the second instalment of my new series, Worth the Cinema Trip, where I rate films, you guessed it, on whether I think they're worth the cinema trip. Ranging from, yes, it would be criminal not to view this on the big screen, not a masterpiece, but makes for a fun cinema experience. Sure, if you fancy a cinema trip, but I personally wait for the streaming upload, and don't waste your money. Each of these rankings are of course my own subjective opinion and I'm the biggest advocate for the cinema, it is my happy place, so please go see whatever you fancy and support your local cinemas. That being said, for me, The Holdovers receives a, it would be criminal not to view this on the big screen. Before I break it down, I have to admit my bias, as I already knew going into this film that I'd probably like it. As a lover of deeply sad comedies, unconventional Christmas films, folk music and the 70s in general, this film ticks a lot of my boxes. And if I was able to see this in December, as it was intended, <clears throat> then this video would be dedicated as to why I think it is a new Christmas classic. But I'm sure we are all well past the Christmassy mood by now. All jokes aside, what is going on with the UK distribution and why did I have to wait three months to watch Priscilla in the cinemas? And don't even get me started on Ironclaw. If this carries on, you will catch me moving to America. Now, the main overall thing that I loved about this film is how cosy and comforting it felt, despite its heart-wrenching themes. This is ironically something that the director doesn't necessarily agree with. People have been calling The Holdovers a cosy movie. Mm -hmm. Does that square with you? Squares with me. I don't think it squares with Alexander. I think Alexander, for some reason, takes exception to it being called cosy. And I think he's just being a bit of a curmudgeon. I think, I think he knows exactly what people are talking about, and I think he likes it. I mean, come on, Alexander, lean into the coziness. I think that there are many factors that you could attribute to this cosy feeling, whether it be the snowy setting, the soundtrack, or the lovable characters. But for me, the main thing that stood out was the sense of nostalgia. Now, if you've watched the film, this is probably the first thing that you noticed. Right from the opening credits, the way it is shot, the amazing set and costume designs, even the audio sound dated, and it instantly transports you back to the 70s. And I can imagine that for those who lived through the 70s, this would have been an incredibly nostalgic and transportative viewing experience. I personally wasn't alive in the 70s, but that doesn't mean I didn't experience these same nostalgic emotions. I think that for a lot of us, we tend
tend to look back at the time before we existed with rose-tinted glasses, aka we over-romanticise it. There is actually a term for this called rosy retrospection bias, but I prefer rose-tinted glasses because of the Levium rose of it all. It's easy to think that the past equals simpler times, before scary things like AI, social media and Jeff Bezos existed. Of course, this is not entirely true that the past equals better, but I would argue that the 70s period setting of the film definitely lends itself to a more immersive sense of escapism than if it were set in present day. This is arguably the same reason that a lot of people find Pride and Prejudice style period films comforting, because they feel so far removed from what we are experiencing now. But the important thing about this film is that it isn't just trying to emulate or rip off a 70s film, it's also its own thing. It doesn't feel forced or inauthentic it has its own fresh and genuine charm. And I think that a lot of this charm is rooted in the screenplay by David Hemmingson. The script itself is oozing with heart and integrity, but this is not surprising when you consider that the script was inspired by David's first-hand experience attending a similar prep school. It is genuinely hilarious, and I don't just mean that it has some funny moments. It has iconic, quotable lines that I'm still thinking about now, and it is filled with entirely memorable scenes that I will look back on and reference in random conversations for years to come. I am sure. David manages to find the perfect blend of comedic and dramatic moments, which are perfectly timed to keep the film's pacing engaging. Alexander Payne takes his heartfelt script and breathes life into it, maintaining an authentic, consistent style throughout and creating an aesthetically beautiful film in the process. And the way in which his direction handles the story and its characters makes the film feel timeless. I hate to say they don't make movies like this anymore, but apparently now they do, and I'm so glad that they did have to mention how great this film looks, it was shot entirely on location, another element that adds to the film's authentic look, shout out to the location scouts, and you might be surprised to learn that it was actually shot digitally despite the film's stock textured look of the film, which was cleverly captured by cinematographer Igor Brild. And of course, the costume, set design, hair and makeup are the meticulously detailed string that ties the whole film together. The soundtrack of this film is perfect. I mean, they had me at Libisa Frey, and I have been listening to Silver Joy on repeat. You can tell that a lot of effort was put in selecting these songs, which encapsulate the film's essence. And in the same way that the film looks like it was shot in the 70s and has just recently been discovered, the soundtrack also encompasses modern songs that, unless you already knew them, would most likely assume came straight from the 70s. It would be redundant for me to make a video about this film and fail to mention the amazing cast and characters as to me, the characters are the film. Starting with the wonderful Paul Giamatti, he is an actor that I've grown up watching, appearing in so many films that I love, but I have to confess that he is someone who I never truly appreciated as an actor until now. I'm not sure if this is because he was often portraying sporting roles in the films I was watching, or that his performances were just so effective that I wasn't thinking about him as an actor. For this neglect, I can only apologise Paul, but I think that me and the rest of the world are finally recognising him for the amazingly talented actor that he is. This role was made for him. Quite literally Alexander always had him in mind, but I generally couldn't imagine anybody else playing this character. His comedic delivery and timing was unmatched, but equally his more serious moments revealed so much about the character without him having to say much. I have loved the wickedly talented Dave I and Joy Randolph since I first watched High Fidelity the TV show. Justice for High Fidelity the TV show that was cancelled too soon, may she rest in peace. And I'm so glad that she was finally getting her flowers. She absolutely stole every scene she was in for me and had me constantly tearing up. I think that she perfectly captured the pain, vulnerability and numbness of a person who is grieving, whilst equally encompassing a character who was strong and authentic. And I'm absolutely rooting for her Best Supporting Actress win at the Oscars. Side note, please go and watch her BAFTA speech if you haven't already, I cried. When it came to casting the character Angus Tully, the casting crew had auditioned over 800 potential actors, but it wasn't until they turned their search to the drama department of one of the actual schools that they were shooting in that they found Dominic Sessa, a talented student who had never acted on screen before, but my god, you would not know it from his performance. He was a amazing at capturing the complexities of Angus as a character and I can't wait to see what he does next in his career. I think that he is a star in the making, watch this space. This cast of characters provided a perfect spectrum of personalities and their character dynamics and development had me emotionally connected to them from the beginning to the end of the film. I cared so much for these perfectly imperfect characters. If you couldn't already tell, I love this little slice of life film. And if you're waiting for me to say something negative, I'm sorry but I'm leaving you high and dry. It is ultimately a film about three people who feel entirely alone 
at arguably the worst time of year to feel alone. It captures the essence of what it means to be human, the good and the bad, and I think that it sends a lovely message that you never truly are alone and that family can mean the people who are there for you, which for me is the perfect Christmas message. And I can't wait to rewatch this every December for the rest of my life. So go and see if you haven't already and let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. Give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and feel free to subscribe if you want to see more reviews and recommendations.